Welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for taking time out of your evening to join us. And Dr. Lily White and Dr. Robinson, thank you both for, for being with us this evening. Um, and thank you all for joining our first Thursday's webinar. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Chad Smith. I'm the CEO for New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau. New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau is a membership organization that advocates for our state's agricultural families to ensure a successful future for food production in New Mexico. Today's webinar, for those that don't know them, features Dr. Lily White and Dr. Robinson with New Mexico State University's Department of Agricultural Economics and Agricultural Business. Their presentation is an overview of niche beef marketing opportunities for New Mexico's beef producers. So Dr. Lily White, Dr. Robinson, I'll turn it over to you. And if you all have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we'll have a chance to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So thank you again and I'll let you guys run with it. Thank you, Chad. I'm looking at the list of all that's logged in and lots of familiar faces. Um, we're excited about tonight. All this change that's occurring in the marketplace is definitely creating opportunity and change for consumers. And so we're gonna kind of go through um, a presentation, kind of a, a summary of kind of what's happening in the food world in the US. Um, and then we'll go into kind of a refresher of the basic marketing concepts and then we'll be open for just some general discussion. Again, um, in December, we presented on the state meat inspection opportunities for state meat inspection program. So this is kind of a continuation of that same type of discussion of where we're at in New Mexico and um, the opportunities ahead of us. All right, so let me get my PowerPoint up and we'll get started. Hold on one second. Okay. I can't see it. Hold on, sorry guys. It's the way this works, right? It is, every time. Every time. Okay, so, Elaine, you have to tell me what you're seeing again, because apparently it closed it. So is it one slide or two slides? It's all your slides. Yeah, great. Okay, one moment, please. I'm sorry. Stop sharing. Try it again. Okay. There you now, go. what do you see? Perfect. All right. Okay. So again, um, our contact information is on this slide for those of you that, if you have any additional specific kind of questions, we're happy to answer. Um, but I think m the majority of you that are on here right now um, know where to find Dr. Lily White and myself. So. Um, Jay, would you like to just say hi before we jump into this? Hello, everyone. I, I told Chad she's she's controlling it tonight, so I'm, I'm going to sit here and smile. <laughs> okay, make sure the smile happens. You're the cheerleader. That's your job tonight. All right, so like I promised, we're going to kind of um, talk about what's kind of going on, where, we are, where the meat industry is, is coming from and where we're at kind of at this point um, today. All right. So recognizing kind of where we were before COVID hit, right? Think about your lifestyle at that point. General consumers were eating out almost five times a week doing lunch and dinner. Typically there would be some kind of a beef product on there, right? If you consider most households in the US were going to the store about two times a week to buy their supplies. And the average dining out um, per person was about $36 a person. So you think about 
back in the day, right? That's what I feel like saying. And it was just a few months ago. That seems like a million years ago. The, the eating out, if you think about where you're at right now, how often do you eat out? Maybe once a week? And it's not even eating out, it's takeout, right? So when you think about the shift that's happened for consumers the, from going from eating out five times a week, and that's not breakfast or coffee runs or that is lunch and dinner only, guys, five times a week. When you think about that, you think, okay, so where are we going now? While you're thinking, let's look at this next slide. When you consider where New Mexico's red meat production is currently. If you look closely at that, the blue line is the total US, um, which is trending, trending up, um, up until 2019, the, the data goes until 2019. And the orange dotted line, of course, is New Mexico's production. Pretty significant decline. And you're, and you're all thinking, okay, Chatty, stop talking about all the sad news, right? Now let's add COVID into this mix, right? When you think about what's happened with COVID and the impacts COVID's had on us, the going out to eat five times a week is gone. The going to the grocery store twice a week. In seven days, consumers were going to the grocery store twice a week. I was doing that myself, working full time, shuffling kids and still making time to go to the grocery store twice a week, partly because I love to watch people shop. But when you stop and you start thinking about what COVID has done to consumers and what it, the changes that have occurred, right? On this slide are a few headlines essentially from different publications. We've all experienced this, we've all lived it. No surprise here. Take it one step further, when you start looking at where the meat plants have had temporary closures. This was of June 23rd um, of 2020. So it's middle of the summer, pandemics pretty much hit that kind of that flat summer level, right? But when you look at the closures, the limited operations and the reopenings, then it kind of explains the next slide, which is what we've all experienced, right? How many of you walked into those stores and saw the empty shelves? It's kind of boggling, right? When as a, as a mom and as a consumer, I have walked in and bought anything and everything I've ever wanted, it's there as long as I could afford it, right? It wasn't about availability, but more about, um, more about it being available, let alone these, the type of um, limits that the retailers were setting. They set limits on all the animal proteins, they set limits on milk, they set limits on things that as consumers, we've never had to back away from. Okay, so now all of this is out there, right? What, what did the consumers do is the question. Where were they going, right? We're in lockdown, where are we getting our food? You're not going to Chilitos or Andales, right? Where are you going to go eat? You're going back into the kitchen. How many consumers are comfortable in the kitchen? I remember reading articles in 2018 and 2019 about builders scaling back kitchens because consumers buying homes didn't want big, big kitchens, right? Now what are they doing? They're panicking when you think about it. So as these consumers are responding to empty shelves, what do you think they're buying? Anybody, anybody? So this data was collected through the Nielsen register datas from grocery stores. And it shows the before COVID December 2019 growth option, or the growth that had occurred in the last six months. And then after February, the end of February of 2020. How many of you have powdered milk in your pantries? Right? I had a guy stop me at the Albertsons on El Paseo and said, where's the powdered milk? I had never bought it in that store and I'd shopped there for 20 years, guys. I had no idea. It's in the baking goods section, FYI. But when you start looking at this, what are all these products? Powdered milk, dried beans, canned meat. Consumers, if you ask a 20 year old what canned meat is, they might tell you tuna, 
maybe chicken, right? They don't know what canned meat is. Rice, tuna, biscuit, mix, pasta, they're all pantry items, right? How does that fit into the meat world? Let me take you one more step. So their pantries are full of all this stuff. Now, what are they gonna do with it, right? So these are all, all these facts that are on this slide, I collected through a bunch of different articles. Nielsen data, um, the grocer's headquarters, um, the NDG or NDP group, excuse me, that's a market research group that collects data for different industries specific to industries. Let's talk about a couple of these. Okay, so we all know that toilet paper was stockpiled, right? How about cold medicine? Anybody have a cold during this mess? Not so much, right? I didn't, thank goodness. People were hoarding. They saw a huge growth, like 50% or greater in toilet paper purchases, health supplies, and pantry items. Specifically, cakes, frozen treats, and adult beverages saw a huge growth. Margarita mix, guys, 191% growth. What's that tell you they're doing? Dad's grinning, right? Party on, right? Sitting at home on the gazebo having a cocktail. But the interesting part is, is this next one. In the United States, partly because of COVID's impact on the supply chain, being the people in the manufacturing plants were unable to go to work because they were sick. And because in the US, so many consumers wanted to buy a freezer that they'd never bought before or a second refrigerator because they were worried that their availability of their types of foods that they want would not be available. So they would rather buy it and freeze it or have that second fridge to keep enough for a couple of weeks. Anybody guilty of this? I'm looking, anybody, anybody, anybody? I have three refrigerators in my house. There's four of us guys. I have two full size upright freezers. You can't put a full beef in one. Right? Think about that. How many consumers are doing that? I was a rarity among my friends. They nobody had freezers. Guess what? In the last nine months, they all have a freezer now. You cannot buy a freezer in the US. If you just walked in, if you got one, you would be a rare, lucky, lucky individual. Any appliances? Anybody had a chance to go in and have to buy a refrigerator lately? That day of just ordering the perfect fridge that you had to have all the accessories is gone right now. You buy whatever they have available in the supply chain because they're just not available. The sale of small appliances are up 24% in general. Specific electric grills, 99% increase, guys. Air fryers, 81% increase. What's that tell you? They're at home cooking, right? They're buying things that they've never used before. And even in the small apartments, an electric grill will work. You can still grill your steak, you can grill your hamburger, grill your chicken breast, and have very small input. You don't have to have the big grill in the back, right? Those little ones will work. The sale of housewares is up 28%. What's a houseware, you say? It's pots, it's pans, it's silverware, it's all those cooking gadgets that my mother-in-law loves that I just don't need. All of that stuff, 28%. Again, the public in the US is cooking. Great, right? So when you start looking down through there, you think, okay, so where are they buying all of this, these items? Anybody, where do you buy your stuff right now? You're online on your phone, right? Am I right, Chad? You pull it up and say, hey, what's Amazon got? I need a new Instapot. You're buying it online. In 2020, May 2020, 40% of shoppers were ordering their groceries, not just their gadgets, but their groceries online. And that's up from 28% in May of 20, 2019. So in one year, we've had some serious shifts in the way we're ordering and purchasing our groceries. That last note is a negative for the industry, for all meat industry, all anybody in the food industry. The decline of full service restaurants, 80% during the lockdown. It's 
pretty hard to stay in business if you have that kind of a significant, it's, it's like the bottom fell out for them, right? Okay, so all this is going on. So now you think, what is the US consumer? How are they responding to this, right? Of course, we're eating at home. Consumers eating at home, it grew according to the NPD group, which again is that market research. They do lots of register um, retail data collection. It grew from 80% to 87% in the last nine months. The interesting part about this eating at home, you think, well, 87% is not that much. But when you step back and you think about eating out five times a week for your dinners and your lunches, and you think, okay, I can see that there's a lot going on. Of those that are cooking, the Gen Z group, this is the interesting. The, the baby boomers, the, um, the, the older part of our population, they're the ones that don't want to cook anymore. They're not enjoying it. They're fatigued. They're tired. They're tired of cooking the same menu, same recipes. But this group of Gen Zs, 43% of them are saying that they're enjoying the cooking and they're, they're going to continue this. So the food service sector is going to not, once they're open and going, this group's already saying that they're not planning to go in as frequent, frequently as they were planning or had in the past. And this last, that last little note, consumers, consumers are cooking an average of nine meals a week. You think nine meals, it's not very much, but if you cook large portions and you divide it up for lunches and leftovers, right? Anybody do the three pot roast in a roaster? You eat pot roast one meal and then you make burritos the next meal and then you make something the next meal with all the leftover meat, right? You cook it once, but you have multiple meals out of that same that same cook time, and that's what's happening. So consumers are cooking at home nine meals a week. So the marketing side of me says, okay, so what do you do with all this information? How do you use it to grow and help market our niche marketing group in New Mexico? For sure, the co consumers are looking for new recipes, new ways to use their current appliances or their current little gadgets they have in their kitchen. They're looking for time-saving ideas in the kitchen. So again, like the three roast and one cook, you cook them all, you make the house hot once and you have meat for the rest of the week. Um, and then of course, this healthier, quicker options. There's quite a bit of data out there about um, how consumers, initially they were eating lots of cake and drinking beers and having margaritas, right? And eating a lot of bread, but the reality is we've been in this now for 10 months and everybody's pants don't fit and we're all wearing elastic waist. And now what are we gonna do? We've gotta start figuring out a way to eat at home on a healthier platform. So with that in mind, some of the online grocery shopping trends that consumers are looking for, right? If you think about your own how many of you have done some shopping online, grocery shopping online? Becky's on. Becky, I know does. Come on, guys, you got to talk to me a little bit. How many of you do grocery shop? This feels like my class now. Come on, talk to me. I'm sorry, Chad. I'm telling them to talk to me. Get off mute and talk to me. There's only a handful of us. So talk to me. How, what do you look for when you go online? Do you just hit your normal old list that you've had and you've just reorder the same thing in the click of a button? Or do you look for specials? Do you look for sales? This is where there's a lot of opportunity, guys, for all of our marketing. Somebody's wanting to chat. So Becky's saying that she gets dry goods online, usually the same old stuff. But think about those consumers that are looking for something new. So if you had a special, you had a promotion, that was the next, there was a survey done by the produce marketing guide that, and this is about produce, but the reality is I think produce and meat are both perishable. They're both things that people traditionally want to go look at. They want to hold, they want to smell, they want to look at it, right? So I think it parallels a lot with, with our meat discussion. So consumers want to see what's on sale. They want to see what kind of, 
promotions there are. Often they're looking for a separate page of featured items that have recipes associated with it, some kind of a video, tutorials on how to prepare it. This 360 degree video of the actual product, if you have a packaged product and you're able to show consumers what it looks like all the way around it, it gives them a sense of comfort and it's gonna help justify what they're buying and justify their decision to go ahead and add it and put it into their cart. The streaming of the image of the product that's actually on the shelf. This is probably a little more applicable to the, the dry goods stuff, but when you can see it on the shelf and you know it's there and you know it's the size that you want and then the package you want, it gives you some comfort. I think this is going to also apply to the meat industry. If you think about being able to see the product, you can't pick it up, but you can see it and being able to assess the weight, the size, the packaging, if it looks kind of old or if it doesn't, you know, nobody wants to order the meat and it be that gray color that's been out for too long, right? So a couple of other points that the produce marketing guide provides is that the shoppers are wanting ideas and recipes, complimentary goods, what, what all you need to be able to make this recipe with this item. So on our social media pages, if, if these companies, you, all of you guys have social media pages or even a website that hosts that your consumers that are buying your meat can go and visit and you can add a whole recipe and all the items, maybe even show them how you prepare it. It provides a lot of comfort. It also gives the shoppers something new and something exciting something that's going to change up their normal day-to-day -day grind that we're all experiencing being homebound. Especially when you're talking about different cuts of meat or different ways to fillet a different, you know, a, a, a roast and you fillet it different and you make kebabs with it or you, you know, you, you cut it across the grains and, and make it easier for them to prepare or quicker to cook or a, combined a, a big pot roast with a, um, Instapot recipe and feature that on your website, all of a sudden you're getting some interest and you're getting these consumers to one at one, they'll come back. If they like your recipe, they're going to come back and say, what else you got? Um, and then of course the reminders of this, these regular purchase items. If you buy anything on the Walmart, the Sam's, the Instacarts, any of those apps show the consumer the purchaser, all the details of what they bought last time. So you can reorder that exact cart in the push of one button. So on your website, if you're able to, to as well do the same thing and provide these customers with the same option, just to, yeah, it was great. I it, ate all the meat, let's do it again. And that kind of takes you back to that idea of a subscription service. Anybody ever done a subscription service? Kind of an old way of looking at it, right? You think this mail order and every month you get your package. But in today's world with our limited access to the retail environments, a subscription might not be a bad marketing tool. If you think about being able to supply a steady group, it's kind of like a CSA, right? Community supported agriculture product. Every week or every month you get this package and it has an assortment of 10 pounds of some kind of meat different cuts, different, just like a mix, it's going to provide you, one, a steady steady retail base. And it's also going to give them, if you're providing new recipes and stuff, a lot of different options on how to prepare the same old hamburger meat. OK, I have another chat. Let's see what they're saying. Oh, hi, Craig. Buying less because a compulsive buying happens less online than being there. So there, there has been some of that discussion, Craig. Um, meaning that you're not buying the impulses, right? I think we've all probably been guilty of walking into Walmart, right? I go in to get a bag of dog food or a gallon of milk and I come out with $200 worth of Little Debbie's and Hershey Kisses and some new outfit for my boys and I forgot the milk, right? The, the interesting part about it is the retailers are figuring out how to get you to do that. And that's what all these promotions, these sales, these features, that they're working on, when you open their app, they're going to work you to get you to see these new items. They're also doing this new thing, more so in the produce, I have not seen it in the meats yet, but I can see it being very applicable in the meat and cheese world, 
is they're providing free samples of like new varieties of apples. Instead of the same old apples, there's a bunch of new varieties coming out, right? Where they're crossing the jazz with whatever pink lady apples. How do you introduce a whole new variety of an apple? You got to have people taste them, right? Same thing with meat. You want people to taste it. You would normally have some kind of a sample set up so that they can, you know, the consumer can taste it. But a lot of the produce world's doing now is they're actually giving free samples. So everybody that does an online order gets a free bag or two bags of, or not bags, excuse me, one, one apple or two apples of this new variety and they get to try it. So they're still getting the product into the consumer's hands, but it's going out the back door through their online store pickups. But retailers are becoming much more creative with all this. And so between the subscriptions, the promotions, all the extra support that they're providing for their um, online consumers, they're providing these platforms to one, teach them how to use the product and then providing samples of these new products that consumers just wouldn't have any idea about. All right. The best thing about what New Mexico's meat and the US meat supply has going for it, more so probably than a lot of other industries, is that consumers trust. They trust their meat, they trust the supply of the meat, they trust the producers that are growing the meat. Um, with that being said, we have to be very careful not to take advantage of this, right? Not to not to foil this. The spinach industry has, you know, they took a hit from a E. coli outbreak 15 years ago and they still haven't recovered from it. The consumer's still hesitant. Romaine lettuce, the same kind of thing, right? We have to be very careful about what we're selling, making sure consumers trust and, and, and have the satisfaction from our products. So the trick is, is to sell them a good product through these new outlets that one doesn't go bad and is handled properly so that it doesn't spoil. And then that meets their satisfaction. So if they're buying some skirt steak and they're thinking it's gonna make a great steak to eat on the grill and they cook it well done, guess what they're gonna have? Anybody, anybody? Come on, somebody talk to me. Guys, they're gonna have a piece of beef jerky, right? A skirt steak, well done. No thanks, right? You want that sliced thin, maybe make some fajitas. But we have to be careful on how we communicate and what we're selling so that when they get it home and they prepare it, the recipes are easy, they understand what they have, and they have a good quality experience when it's done, All right? So the interesting, Dr. Lily White and I's research with the state meat inspection program when we did our consumer survey, we had 87% of the respondents said that they trusted farmers and producers, meat producers. The same thing was found on um, an additional survey that was provided by the um, Grocers Association. And it is the same, 77% of the 2000 respondents said that they trust producers. You won't get that out of free uh, Cheetos probably, right? How many of you trust Cheetos? We all eat them, but do you trust them, <laughs> right? Delene's laughing at me. All right, so the trust aspect is huge. So let's keep going. I know we don't have all the night's time. So now we're gonna go back into our world of the four Ps. Yes, we're going back, doc, wherever Craig went. Craig, this is Dr. Gorman's four Ps lecture. Dr. Lily White's too, mine also. The four P's. I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm listening. So, <laughs> did I wake you up? So the four P's, right? These have been like the foundation for all the marketing. The product, understanding the attributes of your product and how consumers per perceive it. Of course, your price is always important. Your promotions, your strategies on how to promote and advertise, how to sell your actual product itself. Where, and then the final one is place and where you're planning to sell it, how it's going to travel through the market channels, the transportation, the logistics, the how you're going to get it to that consumer. 
And of course, we added this little last P, which is personnel, which without the right people working and doing all of this, you're not, you're going to have a hard time. So it really should be the five Ps, but for sake of formality in the marketing world, we'll stick with the four Ps. All right, so we're going to break each one of these down a little bit. Are we doing all right on time, Delene? Moving along. Okay, moving along, moving along. Okay, so of course our product in our meat industry, of course, this is a, just a few examples, right? Organic, grass-fed, natural, local. Think about all the ways you can promote and provide your product a, a different differentiational tool. Regenerative is kind of the big new word, right? Do consumers know what that means, regenerative? Anybody? Elaine's saying no, but they're sure going to buy it, right? It sounds good. It's kind of like that organic, right? Sounds good. I'll try it. All of these terms, mind you, you can't say you're organic unless you are certified organic, at least you shouldn't. But all of these terms have a value and consumers have a perception of what they communicate. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't change the slide. Sorry. That's what happens when you start talking all the fun stuff, right? So the organic, the grass-fed, the local, the taste of tradition, the New Mexico grown, all of these different things have a specific attribute that they should add to your product. So all of a sudden your flank steak that a consumer could buy at the farmer's market in Santa Fe that's New Mexico grown is a little bit different than the flank steak at Walmart in the cryovac plastic, right? Understanding the features of your product and understanding what they communicate to your target audience is so important. So on here, we have a couple, you know, the service replacement policy, there's a guarantee. These kind of things are important to consumers, but it really depends on what platform you're planning to sell it. If you're walking into the farmer's market in Santa Fe to sell your product, the guarantee or the replacement policy on the packaging is probably not near as important as that handshake and the shake them and look those consumers in the eye and tell them where they, this animal was raised and what they ate and that they were, you know, part of the family and their name was Mabel, right? Or whatever their name was. For some reason, consumers like to know the name of the cattle. I have cows and I can't name them because then they're my pets. So <laughs> it's this combination, right? But understanding what exactly it is of your product. If you have chicken, if you have, you know, jerky, any of these consumer products, you have to sit back and say, okay, what attribute of them is going to be most favorable for whichever market I'm wanting to go into. If, I, if it's a farmer's market or if it's Walmart or Albertsons or the Save Mart, they're all going to have different attributes of a product that their customers are going to value the most. Right? A product's important. The next one, pricing. Pricing is not always the most important. We've seen that through COVID, right? People were willing to spend, they weren't even looking at price tags on some of this stuff. They were grabbing it, putting it in their cart, getting it home, feeling like they have security in it. But the reality is, is consumers have to care about pricing because we all have incomes that we have to hopefully manage. So recognizing how you're going to sell it. In a niche marketing scheme, you typically are going to sell it more so to a consumer than to a wholesale market or a big mainstream box store kind of situation. But whatever the case is, you have to understand the relationship between the wholesale and the retail. If you are selling wholesale, then you have to make sure you understand the margin that most of those products are out there and understand what the final consumer is going to pay for that. The pricing on a small scale is very tough if you have to compete against those big box stores or the big, you know, the Five Rivers, JBS groups, the Cargills. As a small producer, of course, our costs are much, much higher typically than those guys. And so how you, how you position this pricing is important. Of course, on the marketing, you have to talk about any kind of discounts or allowances meaning if you're buying bulk or multiple packages or you buy 10, 10 pound packages of hamburger, you get a, an extra pound free, any of those kind of combinations, the pricing definitely affects the overall purchasing. 
no question about it. Okay, and then this last one, the credit policy. Anybody sell any livestock on credit? Let me know, I might buy one. I'm kidding, <laughs> not really, I might buy one. As you can see though, in a couple of these pictures, um, hopefully you can see them, but that top picture I thought was interesting. So it's a bundle of meat and there's a lot of discussion right now about doing mixed boxes of meat, selling them, doing kind of a CSA kind of scenario where you have an assortment of meats. This retailer is selling exactly that. And so every consumer can walk in and say, I want a number three. And it's got, you know, chicken, it's got beef, it's got a whole slew of it. Instead of breaking it down individually, you get the whole box. Um, I actually saw a couple of restaurants in Las Cruces was selling assortment of meats like this in the middle of the pandemic, like July. And I thought that was really interesting because they were, of course, making a little money on it, but they were doing an assortment. Um, something to think about. And of course, the next couple is pretty much a standard meat case. Um, and then that meat cell is identifying bulk. Those are, what's that, a five pound bag of hamburger, that tube. Selling bulk in the middle of a pandemic, people have freezers now, or, Second, second refrigerators, so at least they might be able to store it and, and purchase it. Some of the discussion right now is, will this continue? Dr. Lily White, would you like to add to this? I know we, can, we continue to talk about this. Will consumers continue to buy bulk? Will they continue to fill their freezers? It's, it's still kind of up in the air. We're, we're really not sure what's going to happen. It's really easy to swing by and pick up a, or have everybody meet at the local restaurant and have your, you know, your normal meal. But if you have everything at home, you might just decide to stay home. Well, I answer that. I'll have Jay answer that in a little bit. But okay, so the third, second, second P is pricing. And we'll go to the third one, which is promotions. This is an example of a promotion that was on an actual website where they were selling um, grass-fed ground beef. It was buy one, get one free. Um, that was actually their feature for this week on their website. So you go in and buy on their site, um, buy one, get one free. And I think there were one pound packages of hamburger. So the, the promotional side of this is not just the buy one, get one free. The fact that they have a website and they have a following that logs in to buy their meat on a regular basis on this website is very interesting. When you consider adding a whole new step into your process and risking, you know, I have a 120 pound German Shepherd. If a package of hamburger meat showed up at my house, we might not have dinner, right? But the reality is he hasn't eaten anything yet and I have actually gotten stuff delivered. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole new platform. This isn't Walmart, this isn't the super targets, right? This is somebody with their own website selling their meat. Easy enough, you go through and you set up a PayPal account or an Amazon account where they can charge it and it goes directly into your account, makes it pretty easy. So the promotions to get people to go to these websites, so is now the challenge is, I'm sure we all feel the same is our inboxes are full of promotional email slash gadgets or come alongs, right? The little subject line is, we got a great deal on hamburger this week. Are you going to click? I don't know. But the, these promotions and the ability to get people to actually click on the link, the hyperlink in the email, to go to the website to order it is now the, the challenge. The days of having to do the print advertising and the print media, the billboards, the newspaper, the fact is, how many of you even get newspapers still? Very few, right? We get it here at the house. The husband loves it. He sits and drinks his coffee and reads his newspaper and I flip through it. But the days of those advertising big campaigns, they're, they're definitely towards the end of their lives, right? So the advertising has definitely changed. Platforms like TikTok, Instagram, um, YouTube videos, all of those are driving a lot of activity into different websites and being able to customize 
those messages and promotions to reach the right audience, you know, your TikTok might not be the best place to sell a bunch of hamburger. But if you're able to partner it up with Hulu or one of the um, movies, movie channels where you're able to stream the channels and, and get the attention of those moms that are sitting around thinking, man, what am I going to do for dinner tomorrow? It might, it might pay off. Again, the advertising methods, publicity programs, social media platforms, sales promotions, and of course your personal and direct selling. In New Mexico, the farmer's markets have, most of them are back to open at some level. So that personal selling is still an, a, an option for a lot of our producers in the state. Um, and of course the knowing your circle of friends and knowing the circle of their friends, that outreach efforts on the promotion, if you have a cool graphic or a cool recipe and they're all talking about it, you can get a lot of tractions just from your immediate circle, right? So the promotions. Craig, do you remember the last P? Uh, personal. <laughs> that, Is that what well, you're saying? Uh, the we're we're going to go with that. But per personnel is important. And the last one is place in the, the standard four Ps. So the place, again, if, you, if you're talking about niche marketing and you want to have some specialty New Mexico made, New Mexico jerky, green chili, red chili jerky, your shelf, shelf life is pretty long. You're pretty st shelf stable. You know, retailers different types of retailers are much more apt um, to be able to carry and sell your products. But if we're just talking about just standard fresh meat, your options are kind of limited, right? You can do direct sales, you can do um, home deliveries. I saw a guy driving around in a little refrigerated S10 pickup a while back that said ground beef, 99 cents. I don't know about buying ground beef from a pickup that's 1980 vintage for 99 cents. It kind of makes me a little bit nervous, but maybe I'm an over overcautious mother. But, but venues such as the farmer's markets, the local um, restaurants, if they're doing any kind of retail package deals, it's a good opportunity to get your name out there. Also the, the local safe marts, the IGA stores, they are a whole lot more willing to inventory and merchandise local products that the big box stores just are not. The disadvantage is that they don't do a whole lot of online ordering, right? Those consumers typically are walking in and buying, um, but they're still selling a lot of product. So this is this, oops, I didn't change it. Sorry guys, I'm not doing very well. The split screen. And Chatty, just so you know, you have about five more minutes, so we can have a couple of minutes for questions, okay? I got two more slides. I'm, I'm doing this tonight. You're right on time. So the place, again, guys, the type of outlets, the size, the type of product you have, the attributes that the consumers really care about. The 99 cent hamburger might do really well in some of these little retail stores, but at the Sprouts, they're probably not real interested in 99 percent, 99 cent hamburger if it's a 70-30 blend, right? They're looking for a 90-10 blend. Local is great. Grass-fed is great. Natural is great. Regenerative is great. They'll pay premiums for all of those. But you have to understand what you're, where you're taking your product and what attributes those consumers are going to value. So again, the IGA stores, the the little local like pharmacy is a little farm store here in town. Those little markets provide access for small producers, niche producers to be able to reach the consumer without having to go through all the hoopla of the big, you know, selling pallets of meat into the Walmarts. So to consider the place on this, I will have to tell you, it's, it's very important. And the transportation, when you consider what the transportation and the storage requirements are, when you add both of the costs of the transportation and additional storage, 
you really need to evaluate, is it worth going all the way, if I'm a producer in Tucum Carry, is it worth me going to Santa Fe market? The transportation, the storage, when you add those extra costs, maybe a night stay at the hotel, it's gonna get pretty expensive very, very quickly. Okay, so a few other things to consider as far as the, um, the additional considerations for niche marketing. Hopefully you've all, are all familiar with the SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. If you step back and do a, a true SWOT analysis, the strengths and weaknesses are your internal attributes and your opportunities and threats are the external elements that are affecting your marketability and make a true list of how you compete with your competitors, how you place yourself in the marketplace. That'll give you some very clear idea of, of the direction for your product. The customer level marketing, which is all this digital online discussion is definitely a value. Today's world, if somebody has a question about a product, they don't ask their neighbor, they don't ask their mom, they get on their phone and they look it up. Branding is so important. So if you come up and you have a great product and you don't name it properly or it gets confusing and it's similar to somebody else's, it just muddies the water. So the reality of coming up with an effective branding and, and controlling the attributes to your product so that it reflects positively on your brand is essential. And of course, understanding the product life cycle. So re recognizing the product life cycle is the innovators, early adopters, those are the ones that are going to really get your product and move them into the marketplace, communicate it to their friends, promote it in their social media platforms. If you spend a little time to, to get them to engage, the consumers to engage at that level, it's gonna take off seriously take off, all right? So look, the last slide. All of these, all of these aspects of a marketing plan and, and recognizing that meat is a perishable item. It doesn't have a stable shelf life. It's not going to, it could fly off the shelf if it's priced right. If it's 99 cent hamburger and it's a good hamburger, it might really fly off the shelf. But the truth is, is you all of these tools, the four really five Ps, the personnel aspect, um, they are all going to build and to ensure that there's a successful product launch. But recognizing on the marketing side, you have to do your market research. You have to recognize the opportunities. All this craziness with COVID has created a lot of opportunities that a year ago, I would have told you no way, right? A year ago, I... I bought groceries the first time online in January. Who knew and by the end of March, I'd be buying exclusively online. Never in my mind. All right, I got another chat. Let's see. Oh, it's just my contact. It is because I'm afraid if we get cut short, then people will have your email addresses and that way they can email you questions. Okay. So on that note, does anybody have a question? Quick question from Malagder here. Talk to me. On one of the slides that you showed previously on the uh, uh, grass-fed beef and natural, I noticed it didn't say USDA inspected or certified. Is that not in, as important to a lot of consumers? It depends on your consumer. It depends on how well read they are and how much they understand the regulations behind it. That's the scary part is that some consumers understand exactly what that means and value the USDA, but many consumers think that if you just say it's all natural, it's equivalent. Consumers have no idea, to be honest. There's a few that know. Farmers markets, those people know. Shoppers at Sprouts and Whole Foods, those kind of markets, they know a lot more about production details. But Albertsons, Save Mart, Walmarts, not so much. It's a scary thought, right, when you think about it. 
Anybody else? These are just a few, too, of the graphics. There's a, a there's so many different categories for me. It's it's wild out there. Which is probably part of the reason the consumers don't understand what the differences are. It creates a lot of confusion. Anybody else? I do. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, I'm a producer from McKinley County, and this is uh, something new for me, uh, the organic and then the, uh, the grass feed me online. Uh, I just caught it the last uh, four to five minutes of your presentation. Were any of this uh, document that you, or your um, PowerPoint be on the website? Or can you email it to me if we have a better understanding and then to contact you later on? I, I can absolutely contact you later on, but I think Delene's going to have this whole presentation will be, it's recorded and will be up on the, the YouTube channel. Absolutely. It's going to be on our YouTube channel tomorrow. All you have to do is watch our Facebook page and you'll see the link right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see a Gallup folk. I'm from Gallup. I grew up in Gallup. Feels like home. <laughs> you need to come back out here and help us. <laughs> I was just there a couple, last weekend. I saw my mom and dad. <laughs> oh dear. We're at the, we're at our ranch too, and we're really happy with our wing cast for this from last year, Paul and uh, they look really awesome. That's great. That's really great news. Congratulations. Thank you. Even though our drought was really bad, but uh, we managed to pull through. So I'm really, we're, we're proud. That's great. Well, I hate to cut us, cut us short, um, but Dr. Robinson, we certainly appreciate this. This has been a great presentation. Want to thank everybody for joining us and tuning in tonight. Um, please mark your calendars. February 4th will be our next um, first Thursdays. And like, like Delene mentioned, this will be um, posted on our YouTube channel. So please, please take a look at that. Um, and we thank you all again. Chatty, thank you so much. Dr. Lily White, we appreciate, appreciate you keeping the smile on for us. Okay, so we have to ask, Jay, do you think they'll continue to buy bulk? <laughs> that is the million dollar question. It is. <laughs> it is. That is. I tend to think consumers have a short memory, but I, I could be wrong. I agree. I think they're going to be weaned off slowly from bulk. Well, thank you all. And again, thank you, Chatty and Dr. Lily White. We appreciate it. Look forward to our next Thursday's presentation. Um, and thanks for joining us tonight.